Hey, thanks very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, very nice to be here. I'm going to be talking about um, uh, one aspect of the hot carrier solar cell work that we've been working on, and this is uh, on some of the materials work, looking at the phonon dispersions of, uh, of these materials. Um, and I'll go through what, what we, why that's important. Uh, um, in particular, it's looking at the inelastic X-ray scattering that we've carried out recently. Um, in fact, uh, another just title for this talk would be uh, a trip to the Spring 8 Synchrotron in Japan, um, Hyogo Prefecture in Japan, um, earlier this year, which was carried out by um, Rob Passon, uh, Jack Feng, uh, uh, Hong Jie Zia, um, Tran Smith and myself. Um, uh, and it's uh, in collaboration with... Um, uh, the group at Spring 8, who funded quite a lot of the work, actually, they've given us the position to do that. Uh, the group at um, Tokyo University, uh, Professor Su Masakesu, uh, Sugiyama. Um, um, Shua Yegi from Saitama University, who grew lots of the materials that we're talking about here. Joshua Williams um, at Los Alamos National Labs, who grew some other of the nitride materials. Um, and uh, Rob Walters at NRL, who uh, was involved with some of the uh, m uh, multiple quantum well work. Um, so uh, the funding for the trip was actually ca uh, came from ACAP, so that's why it's relevant here. So um, the outline of my talk is I'm going to be talking first of all about hot carrier cells and uh, the, well, some of the things that we um, uh, are interested in for them, and then look at the modification of phonon energies and why that's important for these cells. Um, then look at uh, phonon dispersions and methods of measuring them, uh, in particular RAM and, and um, inelastic X-ray scattering, and talk about the differences between those two. Then look at the geometry required for X uh, inelastic X-ray scattering, uh, which is quite complex. It's a sort of mixture between X-ray diffraction and Raman, essentially. Um, and then some results on the uh, indium nitride and the indium gallium nitride alloys that we've uh, carried out. Uh, and then a very preliminary um, result on uh, some perovskite material, uh, just the phonon density of states um, that we found, uh, we measured with that. And then talk about some further work. And in fact, we've got another trip in, in January, actually, to do that further work. Okay, so the hot carrier cell um, is a device which um, uh, has a very narrow um, electronic band gap. Um, and uh, the idea is to absorb a wide range of photon energies across that band gap. Uh, but uh, then the concept is to keep the carriers very hot through some means um, uh, and, and then to extract those carriers before they can thermalize uh, into the external circuit. So therefore you extract at a high voltage or high energy here uh, with both electrons and holes and get a high voltage in the external circuit but also, we hope, a high current uh, if these carriers can remain hot uh, because, uh, and because they've got a narrow band gap for absorption. Um, so that's the idea. So uh, one of the possible configurations is um, using indium nitride, as I'll describe. Indium nitride is one material that looks very promising for this. Uh, and it would have some structure like this with some uh, energy selective contact to get that narrow band contact at the front. And ideally a second one on the back, although that may not be completely necessary. So the, um, one of the very important properties, we, uh, we believe, uh, in these hot carrier cells is to, or to slow down the rate of carrier cooling, is to interrupt the, in, interrupt the interaction with phonons. So carriers cool um, predominantly by emitting optical phonons. Um, those optical phonons are elastic uh, and, and they're um, um, uh, standing waves oscillating at zone centre in the material. And so as such, the energy hasn't been lost at that point. But they then interact with the lattice and di disperse and di um, um, decay into acoustic phonons or heat in the material, dissipating through the material. So it's very important uh, to interrupt this process for the decay of optical phonons into acoustic phonons. Um, the phonon dispersion of a material like silicon looks like this, it's, uh, 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 with a, oops, um, with a pho uh, range of phonon energies, uh, or a continuous uh, range of energies, all the way from zero up to the optical phonon energy of 62 milli electron volts. Um, and so therefore, uh, there's, uh, or should I should have said that, that this, uh, to block this uh, uh, mechanism occurring, you need to have a, a, or stop energies at half the uh, optical phonon energy. So um, silicon looks like this, it, um, but it has an optical phonon up here, but there are allowed energies down here. Not a large number of states here, but there are enough energies uh, to allow decay by the, of this mechanism. So silicon isn't a good material. Well, not in its uh, bulk form anyway. Um, another material like indium nitride looks a lot more promising because this has a very different um, density of states for the uh, optical phonons up here, determined by the very light, very fast vibrating nitrogen atom. And uh, those of the acoustic phonons down here determined by the very heavy and sl sluggishly moving uh, indium atom. 
and there's a big gap in these, between these density states, at least in principle. And so decay by this mechanism is actually physically impossible, uh, at least in principle. Uh, and so it'd have to go by some other mechanism which would take a lot, um, be much more complex and take a lot longer. So that's the uh, underlying idea. So we're interested in investigating the phonon energies and the phonon dispersions in a range of materials, particularly the nitrides. We'll move on to some other materials. So inelastic X-ray scattering is a technique, um, uh, it's essentially Raman, um, Raman um, spectroscopy, but with very high energy photons, uh, X-rays, very, very hard X-rays. So uh, uh, in Raman, uh, and in the, all these techniques, the photon comes in uh, with a given energy, it interacts with the material um, and gives off a phonon, an optical phonon usually, um, uh, and then the, uh, uh, the photon comes off again, l having lost a little bit of energy. And of course in Raman we measure that um, energy and the energy change is the, is the phonon energy. Um, there's also a momentum transfer as well when that occurs. In Raman, uh, that's very small, so we don't worry about it, but um, uh, for high-energy X-rays, it can be actually very different. So the change in momentum here, P2 minus P1, uh, is the energy, uh, oh, sorry, the momentum of the phonon. Um, and so therefore, if we had uh, enough momentum transfer there, we could actually measure uh, a range of phonon energies uh, away from zone center. So the key is um, how the f momentum is determined, and the momentum is uh, a function of the wavelength of the, uh, of the photons, of the light. Um, for visible light, uh, around 1,000 nanometers, uh, well, I suppose um, almost visible, uh, the, the, um, uh, uh, the, the f momentum is given by this, and uh, the, um, that's very much less than the momentum uh, of the, in the crystal lattice. Uh, so um, that you don't get, uh, uh, th there's almost zero uh, negligible momentum in the ph phonons in Raman. However, with hard X-rays with a, a wavelength of um, half, a, half an angstrom, uh, that's, that's not the case. There, the momentum is actually a lot greater than, or greater than the uh, momentum of the uh, in the lattice. And so then we can actually probe across the brilliant zone and look at um, a range of phonon energies, uh, 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 sorry, a range of phonon momentum across the uh, uh, brilliant zone. So um, you need very hard X-rays for this, um, and hence you need to go to a synchrotron. You know, not just any synchrotron either, it has to be a, a, a very large synchrotron, and there's only three in the world, um, uh, two in the States, and uh, this one, the uh, Spring 8 synchrotron at, in Tsukuba, uh, uh, sorry, in uh, Hyogo, uh, Japan. Uh, actually, there's uh, two beam lines doing IXS on, on the Spring 8 synchrotron. The uh, photon energy is right up at 17.8 kilo electron volts. I think the other beam line is even higher, actually, 19 or 20 kilo electron volts. Uh, and you need these very hard X-rays to get the small, uh, the very short wavelength. Uh, the geometry here is quite complex. Um, uh, uh, essentially, they, looking at the side view here, the beam comes from the synchrotron, from the beam line here, um, and it goes through a monochromator, and then is reflected back onto the sample here. And then um, the photons coming off uh, go off, off to first an analyzer, uh, and then comes reflected back to a detector. And on this plan view here, we can see that the photons coming in here uh, 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 hit the sample here, they interact with the sample, and then go off uh, down this route to the analyzer, and then reflected back to the detector, which is back here. Um, so the position of this arm uh, can be changed, and this is a huge great thing, it's six meters long, uh, so it's a very large um, uh, 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 um, experiment on the end of the beam line. And so this can be moved, and the geometry of the sample can be changed um, uh, very, uh, 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 through all degrees of freedom using a four, uh, four, four circle diffractometer here um, to orient the sample in whichever direction is needed to get the particular information from the device. So this is the, the picture of it, the four circle diffractometer here with the sample mounted in the middle here somewhere, I think. Um, and then uh, this is the uh, analyzer arm here. Uh, it doesn't quite look it actually, but that's about six meters long. And the x-rays are actually coming out of that hole in the wall behind here. They come all the way along here. Okay, so um, the analyzer, it, which this, this thing here is mounted at the end, is mounted in this, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, the analyzer is mounted in here. And that's actually a series of um, um, curved silicon mirrors, um, um, isotopically pure silicon, silicon uh, ke uh, uh, which uh, reflect um, the photons, uh, the reflected photons back uh, down here. Uh, and then the analyzer um, is mounted uh, uh, along here. So, uh, I'm sorry, yes, that's right, okay. So, um, these are some of the data that come out from this. Um, this is a, uh, uh, there are 12 um, analyzers, 
each of them a very, very slightly different angle, but essentially they're giving the same information. Uh, and you can either analyse one of these plots or a combination of all of all of them. It, it t tends to be quite good to compare them with each other and see which uh, uh, to, to give any information about whether the angle is slightly off or anything. Uh, but nonetheless, essentially these are all given the same information. This is. Um, the results for uh, uh, an indium nitride sample um, uh, is a wort site um, structured in indium nitride sample, which is the common form. You can have cubic. Um, and it's at the a, um, uh, direct in the A direction. So by using that diffractometer, we can uh, rotate the sample around to give any, any particular or orientation of the sample. And in fact, that's what you do. You do many different orientations all the way around uh, and then do a, 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 a scattering experiment like this in each direction. So looking at one of those um, directions, we tend to choose the central, um, one of the central detectors or central analyzers for that. Um, uh, we can then compare this with model data for where we expect the phonon um, energies to be. Uh, and uh, this is uh, model data. Well, it, it's, it's actually tabulated in literature, but we've also done some... Uh, Hongzhou uh, has carried out a wide range of calculations of the using, the, these using um, an Abilicio model for the calculation of the phonon energies. Um, and uh, it, we see a, a very good match for uh, 20 milli electron volts and um, about 70, 72 milli electron volts here for those two energies here. And another big peak um, uh, at 40 milli electron volts. Um, incidentally, this is the instant beam one here at zero. But uh, the, um, the, uh, so this is an unexplained peak. Uh, but actually, well, it is explained actually, but it's, uh, it's, it's actually because of the sapphire substrate. Um, uh, and that causes a bit of a problem. Uh, something I didn't mention is that um, the, whilst it's um, uh, quite interacting, the X-rays are quite interacting, they, you do need quite thick samples. Um, uh, so ideally about a micron uh, thickness. These ones are actually about 500 nanometers, so a little bit on the thin side. But in comparison with uh, neutron detection, uh, neutron diffraction, which is the other method of measuring uh, phonon dispersions, uh, there you need a, at least a centimetre thick or a centimetre cube sample, which of course is very uh, difficult to achieve within films. So um, uh, this is one of the problems that we do get these substrate peaks coming through. And there's a lot of work still to be done on trying to uh, remove those substrate or allow for those substrate peaks. This is the um, uh, uh, a collect collection of all those data for the l all the different directions here, many different directions, uh, I think it's about nine in here. Um, and there are all the data points here, these uh, various different coloured symbols. Um, and the, the modelled phonon dispersion, um, as well, actually calculated by Hongzhou and also um, uh, from literature, uh, to compare. Now, there's lots of different coloured symbols on here. Um, the red and the green ones uh, are uh, essentially all the peaks, the real peaks, or the ones that we can identify as being real, um, which re re reasonably well fit the model. All the blue peaks here are all the sapphire, the, the sapphire substrate peaks. And so uh, we haven't quite had the courage yet, but um, the idea is that we'll be able to remove all of these peaks uh, eventually when we compl complete the analysis, uh, absolutely. But essentially, uh, we can ignore the blue ones. And so, and the final ones, the black triangles, are Raman peaks, which have been carried out to, uh, in comparison as well. Um, so there's a fairly good match here uh, with, the, um, with the model dispersion. We could definitely do with um, more data points across here, more um, um, uh, momenta in the, uh, in the brilliant zone, uh, to get a better idea of whether these really do track across. There certainly does seem to be some discrepancy here. There's an offset, uh, which we're looking into. There's possibly an offset in the model that we uh, need to investigate. Um, for, to explain these green triangles. But one glaring fact is that both in IXS and in um, Raman, there's a peak right in the middle uh, of the forbidden gap, uh, 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 which this should be, there should be this complete gap here, which is going to be a problem if, there is, if that is the case there. But um, we're doing further work to investigate that a, a great deal further. It tends to appear in all the samples, so, uh, it, uh, which is, um, could be very significant. These are some more data on two other samples um, in uh, indium gallium nitride alloys. Um, I sh sorry, that should say gallium nitride there. So it's a gallium 0.39% and the same on this side as gallium 0.37%. Um, so it's a high indium content ingan alloy and a low indium content ingan alloy. Um, uh, so here we see the model predictions are um, uh, also for large gaps, but um, if I put all three next to each other, you'll see that the gap gradually reduces as the indium content decreases. That's because the slightly lighter gallium atom has um, uh, slightly larger acoustic phonon energies. 
And then these uh, data points that we've calculated, uh, so measured here, uh, uh, again fit not too badly. Again, again, there's an offset with these green triangles, but, um, uh, and there could be a scaling issue here. And uh, the other point is that, that we might not have exactly this composition in the alloy, or rather it might not be um, um, homogeneous across the, uh, across the material. Uh, and, but nonetheless, we do see some, uh, well, particularly in this case, a fairly good match to the, um, uh, to, the, to the model data. So supporting the idea that these materials are quite good for, um, uh, or, or could fit that idea of large phenon band gaps for um, uh, hot carrier absorber alloys, uh, uh, um, materials. Again, though, there's this Raman and IXS peak hit right in the middle here, uh, which again could be, uh, could be an issue, um, uh, certainly could be a problem. Okay, so... Um, that's the main set of data I wanted to present, um, but um, just, just one slide on, on this data here. We also took with us a sample of uh, a perovskite sample, uh, a normal metal ionium uh, lead iodide sample, um, but it was probably oxidised, uh, so that's one problem. Um, now, it gets more complicated when you look at these materials, um, mainly because um, uh, it's polycrystalline, and therefore the... Uh, you, you can only actually measure density of states because all those crystals, when you give a particular orientation, those crystals are all going to have different orientations with, uh, so with a different optometer. Unless, of course, you've got a large amount of texture in there, but, uh, which, which is possible. Uh, a highly textured but multi-crystalline sample might be uh, suitable. But nonetheless, really we can only enter a density of, measure a density of states, but then that's usually sufficient for looking at most of the, the phonon energies themselves. The momentum isn't critical in itself. Um, but it's also very difficult to extract signal uh, from the background. That's very tough, and we haven't really got there yet. These data were only just completed uh, last night or early this morning, um, uh, and we still have got, got more, a lot more work to do on that. Um, and uh, it's very important to remove the re resolution function or, or subtract the resolution function from this, and, and working that resolution function out is actually very complex. Uh, and so, uh, and the uh, well, um, I'll show the data actually. Um, so this, these are the data. So uh, uh, the raw data here, uh, here with and then fitted. Uh, well, sorry, they, these are raw data which have been from which the resolution function has been, has been subtracted, and then a resolution function fit is the green line here. And so um, there are definitely some problems with this data. Um, the high energy tail is very suspicious. It shouldn't look like that. We should see a drop off to more or less to zero. So there's something going on here. Um, maybe because it's uh, oxidised, but also because um, the other thing that hasn't been done here is that the uh, uh, two phonon, three phonon uh, uh, and single phonon results haven't been deconvoluted. So you actually have to go through and do an iterative process where you do all those strictly, and we haven't yet done that. But nonetheless, it's giving some indication that there's a, a phonon energy uh, around um, 7 milli electron volts, which is um, um, somewhere near the region expected, and actually it turns out to be quite important. So it's, uh, it, it is of quite a bit of interest. Uh, and we'll be carrying out some more work on that. So to conclude, um, I talked about the importance of the phonon energies in for hot carrier cells in uh, a role in slowing down the rate of um, carrier cooling and um, how that we can measure phonon dispersion in IXS, essentially high energy Raman. Um, I've talked about the complex geometry uh, uh, um, uh, in synchrotron, uh, um, so for synchrotron X-rays, and that synchrotron X-rays are required because they need to be very high energy. And that there's a reasonable match, uh, maybe that word reasonable is a bit too extreme, but uh, there is a, a little bit of a match to the modelling work um, uh, for the indium gallium uh, 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 nitride alloys, so suggesting the idea that they might be quite good as hot carrier absorbers. Um, and then some very preliminary data on the density of states of perovskite materials, but there's a lot more analysis that needs to be done. So further work. Uh, we're going for another trip. Um, um, well, uh, uh, four of us are going, not me. Uh, some of the others are going to, for another trip to Spring 8 next month uh, to carry out some more work on, on, on these materials. We're definitely going to be looking at consolidating the INGAN results. Um, Measure and measure several other materials as well. We're going to look at hafnium nitride, which turns out to be quite interesting. Uh, some more perovskite samples, higher quality with uh, good crystalline quality, and also multiple quantum well samples. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Thank you. 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 Highest energy optical phonons are around 20 MeV or something like that? Um, 
I don't know where they'll be, <laughs> but they, it, it should truncate that Hanaji tail. But I haven't got. A, really, can, we can't tell from this where they'll be. I'm afraid. So at the moment, it's not completely. Uh, it's not that useful. But I hope from the next time round, and when we get a better idea of how to deconvolute these data, we will we will be able to say what it is. So certainly next year, but maybe by well, I won't say the end of January, but early early next year, we might be able to say that. Give that answer. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. Thank you.